just thank you. You are an omnipotent Savior. And we are invited, Father, Sabbath after Sabbath, day after day, moment by moment, to look to Jesus and live who is able to save us from the uttermost. Mighty God, I thank you for the opportunity that has been afforded to us today to look to Jesus and live, for there, that is the only way to make it through this challenge that we face in our lives every day of being tempted and tried and assailed by the enemy. Thank you for the promise that when God sets his mind to something, the universe cannot stop him from accomplishing it. The Bible tells us, Lord, in the book of Philippians 1 and verse 6, that the good work he has begun, he will indeed bring to a finish. Nothing can stop God from doing what he has desired to do. Thank you, Lord God. We are assured in John chapter 10 that nobody can pluck us out of the hand of the Lord. So help us, Lord, to move forward by the faith and the marvelous assurances that we receive from God's word of God's precious promises and his abiding care and victorious presence in our life. Thank you, God, for this privilege. Humble our hearts as we worship today. Thank you for brothers and sisters who've joined from near and far. And may our hearts rejoice in that, knowing that we serve an able and an almighty Savior. May your name, God, forever be praised, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, friends. Welcome, and may God bless you abundantly. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for what God has been doing for all of us. Thank you for how he's been leading us. And we pray that as he continues to pave the way ahead for us, we will learn day by day, friends, to live by faith and not by fear, to be motivated by God's presence, to be encouraged by his leading hand and his guiding presence through his word, through the spirit of prophecy, and for, with the joy of knowing that we are not forsaken, but rather we are closely held by our almighty Savior. Thank you once again, and welcome to our study today. Our study today is entitled, Nothing Between. Nothing Between. And I'll just set up the screen, and we will all just study together. All right. Is everyone able to see the screen? Okay. I'm hoping you're all able to view that screen. Yes, That's yes, our study. can see that. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is our study for today. Nothing between. And we're going to start from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. And notice what the Bible says. So to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. So to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rains righteousness upon you. What a powerful passage, friends, that encourages us to seek the Lord while we still can. Isaiah says, call upon him while he is still near. Seek him while you still can, because soon you won't be able to. Call upon him while he's near, because soon he won't be, a, he won't be near. Soon probation will close. And so the appeal is to break up our fallow grounds for it is time to seek the Lord. But there's an urgency to do it now, friends, because those doors will not be open forever. We're told in the book of Peter that there is a delay because God does not want anyone to perish but all to come to repentance. But friends, the Lord's time, his patience, his, his long-suffering nature is marvelous. But friends, those doors will not be open forever, not because he doesn't care for the lost and the weary, but friends, because he wants to come and take us all home. And it aches his heart to see the separation until then the assurance is, friends, that he will not leave even a single stone unturned in making sure that his people are brought to eternal salvation in himself. We serve an all-powerful and an all-loving Savior. Glory be to God for who he is and what he has promised to do in all our lives. Let us continue. As the Bible tells us, 
that we are to break up our fallow grounds. It's time to seek the Lord. And then we're given this assurance. We are to seek him till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. Dear friends, I want to speak to someone perhaps who, who has been discouraged because of some experience, who has been disheartened because of some failure in life, because of some setback. And the prophet reminds us we are to keep seeking the Lord and not be discouraged until the Lord comes and rains righteousness upon us. Seek him how long? Until he comes and rains his holiness upon his people. And friends, that's what we're invited to. We're called to break the hard, the fallow, the barren grounds of our heart so that the master sower can come and do his precious work. Aren't you glad, friends, when you read the parable of the sower in Luke 13, the Bible says, and the, and the sower went out to sow. In the heat of the sun, the sower went out to sow. But as he was sowing, the Bible says some seed fell on good soil. Some seed fell on thorny soil. Some seed fell on the wayside soil. Some seed fell on the stony soil. And it's just amazing because I am saying, you, 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 you think to yourself, Ask any farmer, will a farmer waste his precious seed on stony soil? Will a good farmer waste his seed on thorny soil? No farmer who spent so much money and effort in buying these seeds will waste it on, on um, throwing in all these lands that, you know, you probably think they're not going to produce anything. But that's not that great master sower in heaven, Jesus, who the Bible says when he sows, he scatters the seed and, 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 and he lets the seed fall on stony soil, the thorny soil, the wayside soil. He allows every soil, he gives everybody an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Oh, friends, we serve an awesome Savior. A Savior who gives everybody, regardless of what condition you're in, whether you're the stony, the hard soil, the hard-hearted, growing weeds and seeds at the same time, whatever condition you're in, praise be to God. He has given everybody a chance to respond to the gospel message. And that master sower wants to work with you and I today to break the fallow grounds of our heart, to go out in seeking the Lord, and he has promised that he will come and rain mighty righteousness upon us. That is his great and faithful promise. And we praise God because the God who makes promises is the God who keeps promises. Let us go to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1 as we read this important passage. The Bible says, Paul speaking to the Corinthian congregation, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And what do we have here, friends? We have here the reality that Paul is saying, friends, as the, as our, as the Israelite brethren went and walked through the part sea, they were under the clouds. They were really being baptized. They were experiencing a baptism. Notice this, a literal physical event had a spiritual lesson to take from it, and the experience was baptism. It goes on to say in verse 3 that they all ate the same spiritual meat. We know that for 40 years they were eating manna, and yet Paul calls it a spiritual food, a spiritual meat. Physical food with deep spiritual implications. We don't have time to go into that particular text today, but perhaps another time. Verse 4, they all did drink the same spiritual drink. Now, that's interesting. The walking through the Red Sea was spiritual. The, the eating of manna had a spiritual lesson. The drinking of the water. For we read in verse 4 that they drank of that spiritual rock that was following them. And that rock was Christ, the Bible says. So, friends, the rock was spiritual. The water that came out of the rock was spiritual. At least we have one answer that the rock represented Christ. Not that it was to be worshipped. But it was a reflection. It was a lesson that was teaching us about the steadfastness of Christ and how he is the source of that can quench our thirst. And so we realize, friends, that even the water coming out of the rock was called a spiritual drink that if people drank, 
they would receive great spiritual strength. So the rock spiritual, the manna spiritual, the water is spiritual. And someday, some other day, we could go deeper into appreciating these different these different symbols. But it is just beautiful what God is saying to us, how these old experiences have deep spiritual implications. In fact, in verse 11, we are told all these things happen as examples for us. They are written specially for those people as an admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The people of the last days need to pay attention to the people of the early days. They need to pay close attention to God's word for them as they make it through the end. It will only be as they pay attention to the days of the early ones who went through the wilderness experience. Notice what the prophet speaks of as we look at one such instance. The prophet says, with renewed faith in God, the victorious armies of Israel had returned from Bashan and were confident of the immediate conquest of Canaan. Only the river Jordan lay between them and the promised land. Just across the river was a rich plain watered with streams shaded by luxuriant palm trees. On the western border rose the towers and palaces of Jericho, the city of palm trees. What an experience this must have been. Encouraged, motivated, driven because of the victories God has been giving them. And as they reach the borders of Canaan, they are just excited. They're celebrating and they're just excited to know that God is going to give us victory over Canaan. The only thing that lay between them and the promised land was the river Jordan. It's amazing that they had these palm trees around them. And as they looked at the western border, they saw that there were towers and palaces of Jericho. It was the city of palm trees. What a respite it must have been for their soul. The prophet continues to say that on the eastern side of Jordan was a plain several miles in width and extending some distance along the river. This sheltered valley had the climate of the tropics. Here the Israelites encamped and in the acacia groves found an agreeable retreat. Friends, truly it must have been a great shelter for them. It must have been a great sight to their sore eyes after the, the treacherous terrain of the desert wilderness journey, after the rough experiences and, and their, their, their challenges, you know, their complaints with food and water, finally out of the, the, the sunny, hot sun, they had the privilege to rest under the shade of the acacia groves and, and find there a climate like the tropics, a climate where, you know, they could just come and find an agreeable retreat, the abundance of, of the fruit of the date palms that they could, they could participate of, and just what a great sight. But friends, we ought to be careful because we're told amid these very attractive surroundings, they were to encounter an evil more deadly than hosts of armed men or wild beasts of the wilderness. Wow. This agreeable retreat was going to prove to be a more, more deadly than all the hosts of armed men that they had fought along the way of the wilderness. What were they going to experience? Isn't it interesting, friends, that when life is at its calm, when life is at its repose, when when things are all settled and fine, friends, we are in great danger of being assailed and destroyed by the enemy. When we think that all is calm and all is well, it is in the most luxurious and the most, most what we may call as agreeable retreats that we are in danger of being assailed by the enemy. Oh, there are lessons here, friends, for us to learn. Let's pick up the story in Numbers 25 and verse 1. The Bible says, Israel began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now, this passage is really rich. There's another presentation I share in the same passage, and there's more I realized in the, in the same passage that is given to us for appreciation. Now, imagine, friends, they were right at the borders of the Promised Land. Between them and the Promised Land was River Jordan, and they were about to enter in. 
this was a time when every eye and every heart and every mind was to be focused on the goal. The goal was to enter the land of promise, the plan that God had promised and prepared for his people. And just when they were to enter, they were not watching and praying. They got too comfortable. And friends, they forgot the reality that there is no resting on this side of Jordan, my brothers and sisters. God's people are to be ever vigilant, watchful in prayer, and always alert and attentive, friends, because the enemy roams about like a roaring lion. One scholar puts it so beautifully. The fact that God's people know the enemy roams about like a roaring lion, it is a wonder how God's people go about without a weapon in their hand. It is strange knowing that a lion could attack you from anywhere. It is odd and it's, it's just out, out, it just does not make sense how many Christians think that it is safe to go about with the sword, about without the sword of the spirit, the word of God. How do you feel safe, friends, without the safety of the weapon of the sword of the spirit, which is God's word, knowing that a lion could tear you apart at any moment? They got too comfortable, friends. And the warning is sent to us that we cannot get too comfortable. As they did, we are told that there were daughters of Moab that came and they begin to commit whoredom. They begin to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Verse 2 tells us that these women, they came and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The people did eat and bowed down to their gods. I find that interesting. I find that interesting, friends, that as they went to this pagan worship, this is where Baal was being worshipped. And as they partook of this experience, friends, the Bible says the people did eat and then they began to bow down. I find that really interesting to note that they compromised with their diet. And the next thing they found is that they found themselves bowing down to pagan gods. Hmm. I really see a connection in that text between uh, the, the gut and the brain, the spiritual center. There's a connection there between what we put in our body and its influence on the clarity of our minds to be able to think right and make decisions for the glory of God. The prophet continues to tell us that these were Midianitish women who began to steal into the camp. It was the object of these women to seduce the Hebrews into transgression of the law of God and lead them into idolatry. We are told, friends, that these motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship. Under the garb of friendship. These motives were studiously concealed. They wanted to take God's people away, lead them to transgress God's law. The prophet continues to say that they were beguiled with music, with dancing, Allured by the beauty of heathen vestals, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah. Wine beclouded their senses, broke down the barriers of self-control. Having defiled their conscious, consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars and participated in the degrading rites. Friends, it's, 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 just, it's, just, it's just stunning to, to see what was taking place. They were beguiled with music and dancing. Wine had beclouded their senses. And friends, the question I ask, what is it that is beclouding you today? What is it that is beclouding us today? Our subject today is nothing between our soul and our Savior. What is it that is beguiling us? What it is that what it is it that is alluring us away from God's presence and onto the ways of the world? What is it that is desensitizing us to the influences and the impressions of the Holy Spirit? What is it, friends, that's breaking down the barriers of self-control in your life? What is it that is defiling your conscience? What is it that is persuading you to bow down before the world? What is it that is making you offer great sacrifices upon pagan altars? What is it, dear friends, that is causing you to participate in degrading rites? Oh, dear friends, I don't even feel comfortable to discuss how Baal was worshipped. It was utter filth. Sexual immorality at its heights as Baal was worshipped. And all these men joined these Moabite women, these Midianitish women. 
and causing whoredom just when every eye was to be settled on entering the promised land they were being swept away by this moral degradation back in the story we're told that israel joined himself unto baal peor for it was at mount peor where baal was worshiped and that's where they were and as they worshiped baal on that mount the anger of the lord was kindled against israel the anger of the lord friends was kindled against israel and then we ask friends when all of this was happening when these moabite women came in where were the giants where were the spiritual giants of israel where is moses where is aaron where is john where are these big men where are they to give counsel in fact the prophet tells us when moses was aroused to perceive the evil not only were the israelites participating in the licentious worship at mount peor but the heathen rites were observed in the camp of israel friends this story is just dreadful the bible says even the spiritual leaders were not awakened to this evil the deception was so subtle the the conniving was so deeply hidden in under the garb of friendship it looked so innocent even down to the fact that someone who spoke face to face with god like moses could not perceive the evil right away in the spirit of prophecy there is a striking quote that speaks to us about the experience of the prophet the prophet is on a train and she says she saw that there were there were bundles of people getting ready to be burned by fire and she saw that all these people it she said it seemed that the whole world was on this train something to that effect she says and as she says these things friend she points out later on she says i attend i turned to my angel i looked at the conductor who was who was taking the train onwards and and he was a, she ex- describes him perhaps i think as a stately fair person that's her description of the conductor and when she turned to the angel and asked she says who is this who is this man who is this conductor and the angel had to tell her that is the devil that quote is just groundbreaking it's stunning to hear that even the prophet could not immediately pick up that's the enemy she describes him as a stately fair person friends we realize that we are to be on our knees and we ask the question hey if moses could not immediately make out if sister white was not able to immediately wake up where do you and i stand in our relationship with the lord how quick are we to perceive the evil in the things that are set before us friends it was an evil time not only were they carrying out this licentious worship at this mount peor they had brought this into the very camp of israel that was the condition that they were in the prophet sends out this warning and this is where you know we find first corinthians 10 11 come to life the prophet says near the close of earth's history satan will work with all his powers in the same manner with the same temptations wherewith he tempted ancient israel just before their entering their land of promise it's amazing paul tells us all that was written was written for the people of the last days there are lessons to learn from their stories that are to be crucial as we make it through these last days and friends the prophet warns us that the same manner of sins the same temptations that the devil used to keep ancient israel out of the promised land the devil will use to keep spiritual israel also out of the promised land same temptation more bite women coming in and swaying god's people away reality is friends today sexual sins are attacking the church left and right or the ministers or the laity or the church members friends these sins are attacking the church it's attacking marriages and the devil wants to take his people out he wants to sway them away and it's just strange friends that when every heart was to be focused on entering the promised land they were getting swept away similarly friends we are at the borders of our heavenly promised land and every eye and every heart and every mind needs to be focused on entering into the promised land we cannot let anything 
to come between us and our Savior. Friends, we are to be on guard at all times. The story continues, friends, and there's so much to take from this story. Behold, one of the children of Israel came, and he brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And here's something I'd like to just bring to you, which is important to note. Speaking about the time of the end, notice what has happened. Sin has been brought into God's church, into God's camp, God's church, Israel. And as sin is brought in, God's judgments are being poured out. As God's judgments are being poured out, we read that while this is happening, there were a faithful people who were found weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Do not miss this, friends. This is a crucial detail. It's a very crucial detail. Because, friends, the Bible tells us that as sin is seen in the church, in Numbers 25, God's judgments are seen coming up upon Israel, upon the church. We find that there are a people who see the sin in the land, who see the sin in the church, and it makes a weeping that makes cry out from their hearts for the people of God. And they weep before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. You see, dear brothers and sisters, here's my question. And this is building up on what we were studying last week. We studied, friends, that the song of Moses and the Lamb will be sung by those who have learned to intercede for God's church like Moses and the Lamb. The individuals who are willing to put eternal life on the line for the salvation of God's church. In a similar way, again, we see in Numbers 25, sin is seen in the church. God's judgments are on the church and God's faithful ones are not pointing fingers. They're not pointing fingers at divisions and church pastors and people who have erred and pointing out the sins in the church. What God's faithful ones are doing is that they are weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Dear friends, we're going back to where we were last Sabbath. When you see sin plaguing God's church, how do we respond? How do we respond? It's easy, friends, to point fingers, to blame people, to put people down. But friends, God is looking for individuals whose hearts are right with God. Individuals whose hearts are according to God's hearts. Individuals who the Bible says God's eyes are looking for in the book of Chronicles, whose hearts are right with him and they are pleading for his church, just as Jesus and Moses were pleading for God's church. Dear friends, I'm sure you see the challenges this church is facing, the attacks that are hurled at the church, all the enemies' devicings that are thrown at the church. In the midst of all of this, how do you respond, friends? How do we respond? What do we say? What is our response to such an experience? We are to be found weeping for the door of the tabernacle. Verse 7 tells us, when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent, and he thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Phinehas couldn't take it. He took a javelin and he pierced the man and the woman through their belly. And the Bible says that's when the plague stopped. The Bible tells us that day, friends, in that plague, 24,000 people died. Those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000 people. These were individuals, friends, whose eyes should have been fixed on the promised land, but they allowed the enemy to take their attention elsewhere. God's judgments were brought on because sin had now come in. As whoredoms were committed just before the borders, God's judgments were poured out and 24,000 people died. Friend, 24,000 individuals who should have entered the promised land 
but they allowed something to come between them and their savior. And here's the truth, friends, and I'd like you to listen to this. What you keep from God, what you hold back from God will hold you back from God. Let me say that again. What we keep holding back from surrendering to God, that very thing will hold us back from being surrendered to God. Those that died in the plague, those who did not make it to the promised land were a big number. And friends, God does not want us to be a part of the number that will not make it to our heavenly promised land. Let your eyes, let your hearts, let your mind be fixed on that which God has prepared for you. Let it not be said, friends, that the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Let us seek now. Let us seek the Lord now, friends, before it is too late. Let us break up our fallow grounds. This is the time to seek the Lord and not allow anything to come in between us and our Savior. A similar passage is found in Joel 2, verse 12, as Joel, and if you read Joel chapter 2, Verses 1 to 11 speak about God's judgments that are coming. It speaks about the angelic hosts that come bringing and bearing God's judgments. And the Bible says nobody is saved from them. It's, in fact, if you read verses 1 to 11 of Joel 2, you will read that the ground before them is like the Garden of Eden, but the land behind them after they've done destroying, it's like utterly desolate. In the midst of this, Joel says... Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. The exact same things we're seeing in number 25. As God's judgments are coming, there were a faithful few who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle. And that's exactly what God's people are to be doing, friends, in the end time scenario that's just before us. The stories of the past are an avenue to understand that how God's people are to live in the times of the end. Verse 15 tells us this is a time to blow the trumpet, to sanctify a fast, to call a solemn assembly. It is a time to gather the people, to sanctify the congregation, to assemble the elders, to gather the children, for the bridegroom to go forth, the bride to go out of her closet, the priests and the ministers to be weeping between the porch and the altar, saying, Spare thy people. And give not thine heritage to reproach. What a passage that is. What a passage. That reveals to us our work in these last days. That we who are a royal priesthood. We are to be weeping for God's church my brothers and sisters. I plead with you today. This message is an appeal to God's people. Of the work that God's people are to be doing in these last days weeping between the porch and the altar, pleading with God to spare his church, to spare his people, to not give his heritage to reproach. As the Lord speaks of Phineas, he says to Moses, Phineas, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. While he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. That's interesting. Verse 13. He shall have it, his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Wait a minute. Phineas is declared, it is declared that he is to be given an everlasting priesthood. And if I were to ask you the question, who is our everlasting priesthood? Who is our everlasting priest? It's Jesus. We read that he, Phineas, was zealous for his God and he made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now, this is interesting. Who was zealous for his God while he walked this planet? Who is given that everlasting priesthood? And friends, who is making an atonement for the children of Israel even right now as we speak? It is just powerful, friends. That the one who brought an end to the play was a one who is a reflection, who is a type of Jesus, the heavenly Phineas, who wants to put a javelin through the sins that are found in the church. He wants to put an end to the sin in the church. And isn't it amazing, friends, 
that as there were people who were weeping and pleading for God's church, Phineas rose up and put a javelin through. Similarly, friends, it is an answer to our prayers. It is an answer to our firm and our heartfelt intercession that God steps in and saves God's people. Similarly, as Moses interceded and put his eternal life on the line, that Jesus saved Israel that day. Just as Jesus put his eternal life on the line that day uh, is, is the reason why we all have salvation in a similar way, my brothers and sisters. Like Moses, like Jesus, like the crowd in Numbers 25 that are weeping before the Lord, as the people that should be weeping before the Lord in Joel chapter 2, will we be those people who are praying for God's church? That is the question today, friends. Pleading before God that we would not allow anything to come between us and our Savior. What a blessing, friends. Isn't it interesting? Take a look at this. On that day, listen to this, God's judgments were being poured out. And on that very day, Phineas stands up for atonement. Interesting. Atonement, judgment on the same day. That's interesting. In Psalm 106, the psalmist speaks about this, this, this time in Numbers 25. And this is what he says. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. They stood up, then stood up Phineas, and executed judgment. So the plague was stayed. Now that's interesting, friends. As we read in the book of Numbers, it says what Phineas did, the act of putting the javelin through, was an act of atonement. But the psalmist says the act of Phineas putting a javelin through was an act of judgment. And we ask the question, wait a minute. Isn't it interesting that these two passages are not in, in opposition, but in perfect harmony? Because friends, if you remember, the day of atonement was also the day of judgment. It was on the Day of Atonement that judgment was also taking place. Similarly, it was happening in Numbers 25, and the psalmist adds depth to that passage by letting us know when Phineas stood up, it wasn't just atonement, there was also judgment. That was what was taking place that day. It was that work of judgment, putting that javelin through that brought an end to that sin and atonement for God's people. Now, friends, what's really interesting is that this is what is said about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 23 and verse 27. The Bible says also on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, friends, it's really interesting. We are told as part of the day of atonement experience, God's people were to come together in a holy convocation, but not just that. People were supposed to come in holiness, but they were also supposed to come afflicting their souls, humbling their souls. The word afflict there is to really abase themselves. They were to humble themselves and come before the Lord. And friends, we realize this what was what was required on the Day of Atonement. And friends, as we look at the Day of Atonement and we see that this is exactly what was taking place in Numbers 25. They were a people who were afflicting themselves, abasing themselves. They had come together in holiness while unholiness prevailed around them. They gathered themselves and huddled around in holiness as they pleaded with God and pleaded to spare his people. A work of atonement was taking place, friends. It was the Day of Atonement. And friends, that's what God is calling us to do. 
that our gatherings, our convocation should be of a holy order, that our coming together should be that of a holy foundation, that we are to come together as a people as we too live in the anti-typical day of atonement. We too are to come together, friends, and to join together in prayer, in weeping. This is to be the experience of God's people as we live through these anti-typical day of atonement. Friends, are we really part of this work? Are we really humbling ourselves? Are we really huddling around together and pleading just as was being as was being done that day on that day when atonement was being made, when judgment was set? Friends, in fact, we read in verse 29, whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he will be cut off from among his people. And you realize, friends, those who had humbled themselves and were in God's presence weeping, they were safe that day. While those who were out there, like the, the man and the woman who bring, the man who brought the Cosby and Zimri were their names, the two who walked in, the man of Israel who was flaunting his sin, they had not humbled themselves. They were boastfully, openly declaring their sin and, and being proud of their sins, God struck them dead. Oh, friends, this is so, so, so important to note that God is calling for his people, a people that he says ought to humble themselves, a people that ought to put away all things, all minds should be focused on the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Are we joining ourselves, friends, together in that experience? Are our convocations that of a holy order? Are we a people afflicted? Because the Bible says, friends, that those who had not been afflicting themselves, they were cut off. And that's exactly what happened to Cosby and Zimri, the man and the woman who came in that day, flaunting their sin. The man, uh, the man who brought in this Midianitish woman, he was unashamed of his sin as he bragged his sin into God's church and Phineas put a javelin through. And friends, that's exactly the point that if God's people today humble themselves, do you see sins in God's church? Do you see corruptions in God's church? Do you see backslidings in God's church? Then friends, let us be a people who weep before the Lord. For if we do, our heavenly Phineas has promised to put a javelin through every corruption, through every sin, through every backsliding, and he will lift up his people to be right with God, to be ready with God, and to be secure with God for all of eternity. Dear brothers and sisters, I don't know what situation you are in at the moment. I don't know what struggles or challenges you are facing. I don't know how difficult it is for you right now. I don't know what particular challenges your own home church may be facing. Or I don't know, friends, what challenges your own family might be facing. Perhaps there are struggles within the home church Perhaps there are struggles within at the home altar of worship itself. Perhaps the, the devil is deceiving and, and destroying the, 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 the spiritual nurturing of the children in the home. Friends, it does not matter how dark the evil is. If God's people humble themselves and come to the Lord, the Lord will put an end to every sin and to every waywardness. It is the promise of the Lord. It is the word of the Lord that will be fulfilled. I invite you today, friends, do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. I know many parents who are so discouraged because of what's happening with their children. I know many spouses who are so heartbroken because of the waywardness in their spouse. Dear brothers and sisters, the reality is all that is needed is for an affliction on our part, for us to abase ourselves as we cry out to God in prayer. Friends, he will put a javelin through the sin that the devil is trying to plague your home and your church with. And God will give us a certain victory, a certain victory, my friends. So I want to ask today, is there someone today who's frustrated, who's upset, who can't take this anymore, saying, Lord, I can't, I can't take what the devil is doing to my family, to my church. 
And friends, we could gossip about this as many people would. We could gossip about what's going wrong. Or we could be God's faithful ones who are found humbling themselves, pleading for God's church. And friends, I personally beg you, would you be those people in God's church who are not found gossiping, who are found pleading with God for the salvation of God's church? If that is you, if you feel the spirit of God tugging at your heart, be those people weeping between the porch and the altar. And I invite you to join me in prayer as we pray together. If you're able, can I plead with you to kneel with me as we pray together before the Lord? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Oh, Lord God, you love us immeasurably. You love us everlastingly, and it is because of your love that we have come thus far. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Oh, they love God is why they are here, Lord. They're not here for entertainment. They're not here for worldly pleasures. They are here because their hearts hunger to receive the precious word of the Lord. And I claim your promise in Matthew 5 that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. In a special way, Lord, I pray for the churches they're coming from. In a special way, I pray for the families they represent. I don't know, Lord, what the enemy is doing. You know what the enemy is doing, and you alone are able to put an end to the evil in the church, in the home, in our hearts. And I plead for this, Lord, on behalf of my brethren. As I plead for their lives and the salvation of their families, Father, may you please make us a people who are not dismayed, who don't panic, but a people who trust in the Lord and weep before the Lord, for he is a God who is able. Lord, as we live in this anti-typical day of atonement, help us also to be a people who are afflicted, a people who are standing between the porch and the altar, pleading to spare thy people, O Lord. Spare thy people. Father, please keep fighting for your church. Please keep liberating your church from sin and prepare them for that eternal home that you've prepared for us. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen.